Welcome to the latest goals-based investing podcast series. I'm thrilled today to be joined by my friend, Bob Pisani, Senior Markets Correspondent on CNBC. Bob, you've been coming to our living rooms and our offices for decades and decades, sharing the markets, talking about what's driving trends, introducing the latest IPO. But today, we're going to talk about your latest book. I'm really excited about it. Welcome. Thank you, Tony. We, you know, I was thinking about this uh, before we came on. We've probably known each other close to, to 20 years. Uh, I knew you long before, even when you were at Schwab and I think you're Guggenheim. I'm trying to remember all the places uh, you've been at, but I've, I've known you a long time, so I'm happy to be on with you. And, and I have certainly been uh, fortunate. You have interviewed me. Now I get the opportunity to kind of switch. Uh, I loved your book. I thought it was a fascinating read. And I think for anyone who's new to the business or anyone who's investing really should read it because you really give this great history of the exchange and how it's evolved over time. But I think maybe the logical starting point would be to talk about the title of your book, which I think is a little interesting, and then maybe give a summary of what you cover in there, and then we'll delve into some of the topics. Well, thank you. The, I have been at CNBC for 32 years. It's a great privilege. Uh, and I've been the uh, the stocks correspondent um, since 19, oh, the end of 96, beginning of 1997. So we're talking north of 25 years on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Two just great organizations to be with, CNBC, my employer, but on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And you, you, you see a lot of things. And the publisher had a very specific point in taking the book. He said, we don't want you to write a financial history, but we know you're part of financial history. What we're interested in is the way you personally interacted with financial history because you have an unusual perch on the floor. You've seen 10,000 bell rings, literally opening and closing bells, IPOs, celebrities, um, big downturns, big upturns. And we, what we want to hear from you is your voice, your stories, how you interacted with that financial history. So if, if you had to, um, people ask me about the title of the book, uh, I was talking to the publisher about the title. I said, well, I want to call it Lessons on Life and Liberty from the Floor, Lessons on Life and Investing from the Floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And they said, well, that's a subtitle. That's not a title. We need a title. And they said, what do they say to you while they're standing on the floor waiting to go on the air? I have these, it's called an IFB. You put it in your ear and the producers talk at you from the control room. And I said, well, they say lots of things, but this the simplest things that they say is some variation on rap, which means shut up or stretch, which means keep talking. So you, you basically hear some variation on shut up and keep talking. And they said, that's the title of the book, shut up and keep talking. Lessons on life investing from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. So that's kind of what you hear. If you had to say what the book is about, I have witnessed three things since I've been here, which is why the publisher wanted it. First, I saw the growth and the dom eventual domination of electronic trading. And then decimalization. When I got here, people were trading in eighths of a dollar increments, then sixteenths and then pennies. That completely changed the business. That's number one. Number two was be the growth of passive investing uh, and the dominance of passive investing and the growth of the ETF business. Um, and finally, I would say the third most important thing I really saw here since the 1990s is the development um, of uh, behavioral finance. And, and maybe we can talk about this for a few minutes, because I think it's really important, Tony. But th those three things are, are what I saw and what the book's about. Electronic trading and decimalization, the growth of passive investing uh, and ETFs, and the development uh, of behavioral finance. And in between, I throw in a lot of you know celebrity stories about what Aretha Franklin said, or Robert Downey, or even, even people you wouldn't think are particular great um, sages, like Barry Manilow. I had a quite interesting conversation with one day. So a lot of interesting stories in the book. We'll get into all of that. Let me start with uh, the exchange. And again, I, I think as you and I have talked about in the past, I was a young lad on the floor of the American Stock Exchange from 87 to 89. And I, and I remember those exciting days on the exchange where, you know, floor brokers are yelling at one another and they used hand signals and, and paper tickets and all of that. And we've come a really, really long way. I think you do a great job in the book of kind of describing this environment that was that was so rich and it, you know it's something that I kind of think everyone should really appreciate how trading was done in the old days. I, I'm curious your thoughts on um, electronic trading. I know in the book you, you mentioned that it kind of killed the exchange to some extent, but I, I think as you reflect back on it, you think that it's 
helped uh, provide confidence to consumers? You talked about the fractionalization and all that. Has that been a good thing for investors or a bad yes. thing? Yeah, it, here's one overall arching theme. Always be on the side of technological innovation. Um, you, you, you buck that at your peril. Uh, I wrote an article. I'm on the board of the Museum of American Finance, and I wrote an article for their their magazine uh, called High Speed Trading in the 1800s. And literally, there were attempts to um, have new technological innovations beginning in the early 1800s, uh, including the canals. Uh, there was a, a semaphore relay system that operated between New York and Philadelphia, uh, a, a, a literally a, a, a relay system to send signals so that people could, could, could uh, trade stocks ahead of everybody else. Uh, there was uh, high-speed uh, uh, horseback services uh, that existed. Uh, then there was the railroad. Then there was the telegraph, which really changed things. Then there was the telephone in the 1870s and 1880s. Uh, and the floor had one of the very first telephones in the United States. And then, of course, there was pneumatic tubes uh, and there was uh, semiconductors and, and, uh, and the computer. Uh, and what happened here when I got here in the mid 1990s, there were 4000 uh, people on the floor. Imagine 4000, 4000. And they had 80 percent of all the volume that was traded at the New York Stock Exchange was traded on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, and a very large percentage, even in the 1990s, was open outcry, just guys yelling back and forth at, at each other. Uh, and what happened was several things. I mentioned, number one, they went towards decimalization instead of trading in eights. Eventually, by 2000, they were trading in pennies. That sort of destroyed much of the profitability, profitability of the old system. Uh, and then there was just the growth of electronic trading. Uh, by 2003, the New York Stock Exchange had bought Archipelago, which was an electronic trading operation. Uh, and uh, a, a lot of the raison d'etre for the floor open outcry kind of went away because all of a sudden you had an electronic trading arm where computers matched buy and sell orders uh, very efficiently in subsecond intervals. They, they mastered how to do that fairly quickly. The hardware and the software kind of came together in a, a you know 15 or 20 year period between the mid uh, the, between the early 1980s and the mid 1990s to be able to do that efficiently, sub-second intervals. Uh, and when that happened, the floor had a latency problem. So you had a typical floor time between an order and execution of the order could be anywhere from you know 10 seconds, 30 seconds, something like that. Well, if you're executing a sub-second intervals electronically, a delay like that, a latency on the floor is a problem. And that was a major issue for the stock exchange from about 2000 to 2008, when they finally sort of consolidated everything and became essentially fully electronic. Even today, uh, and I'll give you an idea of technological disruption, 4,000 people in 1997, 80% of the volume. Today, there's about 250 people that do 15 to 20% of the volume. That's a very good example, Tony, of technological uh, disruption. I believe, well, as painful as it was, and I, I still, love the floor and still believe that it's important to have adults standing around looking at the markets. And there are people who still do open outcry. Uh, electronic trading is a more efficient way. Uh, it's it, it happens quicker, um, you get quicker execution. Uh, and so this is one of those examples, don't stand in the way of progress. Yeah, interesting. So Bob, you have had an interesting perch to uh, the dot-com bubble, the 9-11 global financial crisis. What was it like down there during that time period? And what sort of lessons can be learned from that? And maybe that's kind of the teaser to your discussion on behavioral finance. Well, from 1997 to 2000, was probably the three greatest years of my whole life to the middle of 2000. Um, I, I always tell people, young people, I hope that there is some point in your career when everything is going right, when the wind is at your back and every day is exciting and genuinely, and I mean genuinely, not you want to convince yourself, but genuinely fun to come to work. Um, we were in an up market. The New York Stock Exchange was powerful and still uh, ascendant, even though there were clouds on the horizon people could see. Um, the the, the, uh, the dot com boom was going on. There was a new shiny object, the internet. Hard to believe it's, it was a shiny object, but it was. It started in Oh, I'd say August 95, the Netscape browser went public and suddenly, boom, 
and CNBC was a ba major beneficiary of this because suddenly people thought, oh my gosh, there's an internet. Oh my gosh, there's companies trying to build out the internet and there's faster computers and you can trade at home. And wait a minute, you can start buying things at home. This was an explosion. And CNBC was a big beneficiary of that. And I was personally standing here uh, on, on the floor. Suddenly, um, CNBC was the hottest thing on television. So it was just tremendous fun and tremendously hard work. We just worked our tails off, but it was fun work. And um, the dot-com thing, of course, eventually, uh, by the middle of 2000, kind of ran its course. And a lot of stuff that didn't make any money, didn't have any prospects, just blew up. Uh, and um, that was only the least of it. We could have weathered that pretty easily because it only affected a small group of people who were investors. And it was like the Bitcoin crowd uh, that happened. But what really kind of messed things up badly was 9-11. That was an unparalleled disaster of much greater magnitude uh, than, than the dot-com bust because suddenly we had several thousand people dead down here and everyone, including me, had friends because it was literally less than a quarter mile from this building, everyone had friends who died. Uh, everyone had people affected. There was a gigantic smoking pit full of debris and terrible smells for a year and a half down here. And there were, people don't want to remember this, but there was constant concerns about another attack. And we entered a recession immediately after. So 2002 was a terrible year uh, for all of us down here emotionally, which is very difficult. Uh, and yet everybody came to work. One of the things I remember is everyone came to work at the New York Stock Exchange, as depressed and anxious as everybody was. That was a year that was terrible for me. Uh, and one of the chapters in the book discusses how I learned to meditate and how it got me through. Meditation kind of got me through it. And I decided to stay on that. I really liked this job. I was thinking of quitting. And meditation helped me sort of realize things had happened externally. It's not my fault. Uh, and I learned to, you know, sort of grapple with the thoughts and the anxious thoughts I had about this. Um, so that was a tough time to get to get through. But we 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 all did. The New York Stock Exchange ended up changing a lot because of not because of that, but because electronic trading uh, was going through and changing everything at that time. Yeah, it was it was a tragic time. I remember 9-11 uh, all too well. Uh, maybe a little bit of a lighter topic. You, you tell these great stories throughout the book and you, you credit Art Cashin as being a great storyteller, which he is, but but I could literally hear your voice telling some of these stories as you're describing some of the things. One of my favorite stories was the story you told about Black Sabbath. And uh, when, you were, when you were reporting from home during COVID, we all got a sneak preview of all of your classic rock posters, which could have different backgrounds every day. Share, share with uh, the audience the Black Sabbath story and the lesson learned from that. I, I think that's one of my favorites. Well, I collect 1960s rock posters. It's a little strange hobby, but you know, the doors, uh, this is a, there's a poster behind me. This is the 1972 Rolling Stones tour. Uh, this is an infamous tour. The Rolling Stones were at their height and crazy as, as all get out, uh, but it's kind of a classic poster. But uh, psychedelia was uh, a an art form that developed in the mid 1960s, uh, largely initially in San Francisco um, around Jefferson Airplane, the Grateful Dead. And it's a, uh, I believe the artists who created this style of, were sort of like the Toulouse Lautrecs of their day. Just Toulouse Lautrec, people in the 1890s in Paris created a visual style. They were also poster artists and it influenced the 1890s into the 1920s. And I believe that these people are the same way. They're like the Toulouse Lautrec of their day. And you could still to this day see the influence of psychedelic uh, visual styles uh, uh, anywhere around you. You just look for it. You can see psychedelia, neo psychedelia, I call it. So I collect these posters, the doors and, you know, the Grateful Dead. Uh, and one day, um, you know, I don't know, a decade ago or so, um, there was an auction and a Black Sabbath poster came up. And I'm not a Black Sabbath fan. I'm In the 1970s, I was a Led Zeppelin fan and Black Sabbath sort of competed with them uh, in the sort of heavy, heavier metal crowd. But this was kind of a famous poster with Ozzy Osbourne waving his hands in his hair. It's a concert they did in Oklahoma, 75. And I, I, I thought, this is kind of cool. All right. Uh, and it, it was $200. And I said, all right, all right. And when you bid on something, if I don't know, those of you might watch it collect, but you always have to be careful about what the end game is. You got to know where you're going to stop. So I figured this poster was worth four or $500. Uh, 
And so I bid 200 and immediately a bid came back 300. Now, when you get a bid and something comes back, immediately there's a counter bid. That means somebody's got a bid above you and they put it in and you don't know how high they're going. So I said, oh, somebody wants this. So I put a bid of 400 in. Immediately bid 500 comes back. So somebody's bidding got prices above you in the auction and there's a minimal that you go and it goes in stair steps. So I'm thinking, geez, that's kind of interesting. I wonder who this is. Because I thought this is about as much as anybody should pay for this poster. So I should stop there because that's what I thought it was worth, 500 and you stop. And I didn't. So I put in 600. Immediately, 750 comes back. Now I'm a little like intrigued and annoyed. Like, I don't know, who thinks this is worth $750? And um, now the bid is, it's either 150 or $200 bids, I forget. And long story short, immediately it's at a thousand. So it's obvious that there's somebody out there and me, there's basically two bidders here. And now I'm slightly annoyed and I'm not gonna bore you, but seven, eight, nine minutes later, I won the auction at $3,500. Now, <laughs> by then I was screaming at, at I'm, I mean, I'm screaming at my phone here, just saying, who is this idiot that wants a Black Sabbath poster that's gonna pay $3,500? So I really, I'm just screaming, I'm because I've completely gone, I've blown apart all the basic principles of bidding. It's not professional to outbid yourself to do that. You don't, professionals don't do that. Um, and I'm just furious. I'm furious at myself and I'm furious at whoever it is. So the next day I called the dealer uh, who's a friend of mine. And I said, look, it, it, this is not proper etiquette. You don't ask the dealer who the counter bidder is. It's just not done. And it's not professional. And I said, I, I, I don't want to bother you. I, I just got to know. I really got to know who's this idiot who, who wants to buy this Black Sabbath poster for $3,500. And I said, and the, the guy has left and he said, oh, I'll tell you, Bob, who the idiot was. It was you. You're the idiot who bought the poster. And I stopped and said, oh, yeah, that's right. I am the idiot. And what happened here was, uh, and the reason I bring this up is a classic example of behavioral economics, where yeah. suddenly I had this idea of owning this poster as a prestigious thing, because I'd never seen it before. And this is called like an endowment effect, where suddenly I thought this thing was worth a lot more because I could picture myself owning it. I actually called a friend of mine who was a behavioral economist and had, I, could, I said, can you explain what happened here? And he explained variations of what's called the endowment effect. Anyhow, it's in the book and it's one of the classic examples of behavioral economics because I knew what I was doing was stupid. It wasn't like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just like some leaf blowing in the wind. I know exactly what, and I still did it. That's how powerful these instincts are. These behavioral instincts can be uh, in your brain. And I went through many examples of the book in this, including um, buying my own company stock when I knew that I shouldn't accumulate so much of it. It was too risky. I knew this and I still did it because I had such faith in Jack Welch, who was the owner of General Electric. They owned NBC 30 years ago. And that's another behavior, overconfidence in your company, overconfidence in your CEO, overconfidence in yourself. So there's many examples of this. And my point here to people listening is you would be surprised the dumb things you do, even when you know they're dumb. Yeah, and there's, there's been so much academic research on behavioral biases, and we all know it, but we all tend to act on emotion and that, that stimuli. It, it's probably a perfect segue. You, you were very generous with your praise in the book on the people who really influenced you, Jack Vogel, Jack Vogel uh, Jeremy Siegel, Bert Malkiel, Robert Schiller, and many, many others. Maybe just share with uh, the audience, why were they so influential? And, and I think what ultimately did they did they lead you down the path to? And I know that kind of gets us into the discussion on indexing as well with uh, Jeremy and and uh, Malfield certainly being champions of that cause. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll make this very simple. When you write a book and you're about your, it's sort of a quasi memoir. It's not quite a memoir, but it's it's a quasi memoir about your interaction with history. You have to sit back and engage in some very interesting intellectual discussions with yourself, which is, what do I believe? Okay, how, what do I think I know? I, I thought I learned a lot and that's what I wanted to do writing the book, explain what I think I know, but what do I know? So you write down a few pages of things, here's my core beliefs. And then you look at it and say, this is interesting. And I believe all of this, but how did I come to believe this? 
Did I read it on the door of a men's room? Who, who taught this to me? I didn't. I wasn't born with these ideas. Somebody, I got them from somewhere. And I had, I had to spend a lot of time thinking about this. I went through my library. I'm looking around. Finally, I came up. I realized there was a half a dozen books and people that essentially were the core intellectual influence on me. And the num number one person was Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard. I met him in the mid 1990s. There's a whole chapter explaining my relationship with him. Uh, but basically Bogle and particularly Common Sense on Mutual Funds, uh, his most famous book out in 1999, uh, Bogle um, showed everybody about you know the way uh, of, of indexing and showed everybody uh, that you can move um, out performance uh, uh, of, of a small group uh, of active managers. Um, uh, it's very unlikely and is usually negated by the high fees they charge. Uh, and Bogle used to berate me for having people on CNBC and making superstars out of people uh, like uh, Bill Miller at Lake Mason saying, you know, these are nice people, but they're very rare creatures and they don't consistently outperform. And you're not explaining this enough to people. He was very professorial, you know, <laughs> wagging his finger at me. This I'm going back in the 1990s and it had a big influence on me. The other one I would say with Bert Malkiel, um, who wrote um, A Random Walk Down Wall Street. Uh, it's just out in the 50th anniversary. I just had Burton on. He's a Princeton professor, wonderful man. Uh, and uh, Burton, more than anybody, uh, help popularize the concept of of indexing he proposed it in the early 1970s he said what the country needs is a simple index fund that people can buy at low cost um i would also uh say um charlie ellis who wrote winning the losers game in the early 1970s charlie was um, also instrumental in pointing out that active managers do not for the most part and the very most part outperform in any way and, and wrote a wonderful book uh, on that. And then finally, Jeremy Siegel, he wrote Stocks for the Long Run in 1994. And there's a new edition out. Um, yeah. and more than anybody, Jeremy was responsible for doing long term invest, uh, long term research into stocks and bonds going back to the early 1800s. And, you know, when we say stocks on average go up 10 percent a year, not inflation adjusted. A lot of that is based on research that he was doing on top of other people that go back into the early 1800s. So there you go, Jack Bogle, number one, Burton Malkiel, Char Charlie Ellis, uh, and uh, 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 of course, um, uh, Jeremy Siegel, uh, uh, intellectually huge influence. And I realized, you know, when I talk on the air about PE ratios or efficient market hypothesis or, or you know, a a anything around fundamental Ooh. analysis, it ultimately went back to what I learned from those guys in the, in the early 1990s when I was becoming the stocks correspondent. So it's an intellectual, it's an interesting intellectual exercise. So what I loved in the book was all these great stories of the people that you met on the exchange from Walter Cronkite to Aretha Franklin to Barry Manilow and Joey Ramon of all people. Um, who was the, who was the, who was your favorite person that you met and what did they teach you? Well, I, I, it's hard to say. The I, I, I will say this: the the biggest thrill I got night in 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 December nineteen ninety nine, two people came on the floor that meant a lot to me. One was Muhammad Ali, and meeting Muhammad Ali, he, and I spent all of seven, eight, nine minutes with him. Um, was really something because even then he was al already in decline. Uh, you know, physically and, and mentally. And yet when I stood by the door waiting for him to come in and I shook his hand and I, I'm six feet uh, and not a small guy, but he's six three. But that wasn't what was impressive. His shoulders were wide. And when I shook his hand, his hand went around mine and I looked him in the eye and I said, oh, my God, this guy is very imposing. Even now, as aged as he is, very imposing. I wouldn't want to go up and be Sonny Liston in 1965 against this guy. I can imagine what he looked like in 1965. He must have been terrifying, you know, tremendous athlete. And he was very serene. The other person that came a week later was Walter Cronkite. Now, the kids today don't know who Walter Cronkite is, but growing up, he was, you know, the voice of America in the 50s and 60s oh. for me. And he came on the floor in 1999, and I was, he'd been retired for 18 years, and I was a little terrified of him because he'd been very critical of cable TV of reporters and announcers saying there was too much, not enough news and too much commentary and criticism. And he was kind of against this 
cable TV mentality. And he came over and I said, hello, I went up to him. I was so excited to meet him. And um, he said, I, I am quite um, surprised at the growth of financial news. It was never a big thing. You guys have like, become famous. And tell me about that. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, my God. Walter Cronkite is interviewing me. This is the greatest thing ever. And I was just tremendously excited. So uh, there's, there's stories about Aretha Franklin, Barry Manilow, Robert Downey Jr., um, a, a lot of other people that, that I met in there. I don't want to go on too long about them, but they all had something kind of interesting to say uh, to me. And um, it, some of them were quite surprising, uh, including a... 10 minute discussion I had off camera. I didn't even do an interview with him, but Barry Manilow came on and uh, was promoting a, a Broadway album. Uh, and I asked him, uh, did you, uh, I was just alone with him for all of a sudden, you're just suddenly there and you're alone, just you and Barry Manilow. And I said, so I, I, just a quick question. Did you write that State Farm jingle? You know, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. I'd always heard he wrote. He said, yeah, I did. I was, a, he said, I was a jingle writer. And he said, I, I sold that for $500. And he, I said, I never, he said, I never regretted it. I did, who knew it was going to be so famous. That's what I did for, a, you know, a living. I was a jingle writer. And I said, so you were here and you, all of a sudden you sold 15,000 seats out of Nassau Coliseum. I mean, it was amazing. It was just six, seven, eight years ago. He said, I said, and you haven't really had a big hit in years. He said, well, you know, what happens is you start out in the early days and you get lucky. You have a bunch of hits. I became very famous. Uh, and then all of a sudden you have the middle part of your career. And what happened to me was nothing. I, I kept performing and putting out albums and doing things because that's what I love. I didn't necessarily have as many hits, but I still sold albums. And he said, I stuck around for a long time. And then all of a sudden you keep doing this and the fan base kind of stays there, even though, you know, you don't have as many chart hits anymore. And then all of a sudden you, you come out on the other side and people start writing stories about you that you're a legend. And then, and then and, and he said, I never changed. I just kept doing what I wanted to do and was fortunate enough to still keep a, a, a core fan base that always supported me. So I thought this was kind of and I'm abbreviating it, but I, I thought this was kind of profound because a lot of people have that problem in the middle part of their career where they kind of lose interest and don't know what to do. And he went on, I'm abbreviating this, about how, how much he always liked the music and he relaxed when he stopped worrying about having hits again and just kept on with doing music and the stuff that, that that he liked so i it was an interesting little parable he was much more serene and philosophical and reflective than i thought i'm not a barry Manilow fan i'm a led zeppelin guy but it was a, one of those surprising like gee it was like 12 or 15 minutes at most discussions and the guy was pretty profound i thought well, Bob, it's uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. The book is Shut Up and Keep Talking. It's a must read. You, you did a fantastic job kind of taking us on this magical sort of journey, this incredible career that you've had and shared all these great anecdotes along the way. Thank you so much for sharing with all of us and continued success with your book. Thank you. And the only the only observation, the only advice I would give everyone is stay long and be careful about market timing. It's so one thing I learned from Jack is don't think you can do market timing. So stay long. And thank you, Tony, for having me. Thanks so much, Bob.